Welcome to the Career Spy Gen Podcast, episode 298. On today's podcast, Jen gives seven tips for leveling up your presentation skills. Tip number one, if this is a live presentation, remember to wear pants. Hey, I'm Jen Swanson, and Careers by Jen is where I help you to get the job, love your work, and advance your career, and I talk about wellness and success topics, too. This podcast is actually ending production after episode 300. However, you can find me over at Careers by Jen on YouTube, where I will be continuing to share career tips, advice, wellness, and success topics, and much, much more. It's been a 10-year run here on Careers by Jen on the podcast, and until we are at episode 300, I invite you to continue listening. Go back and listen to the archives, and please enjoy this show. Thank you so much for being here. Does public speaking scare you? Do you have to make presentations at work or in other situations, and do you want to level up your skills? Well, stick around and I'll share seven tips to help you shine in your next presentation. I'm Jen, and I am so glad that you are listening today. If this is your first time, welcome. And if you've been here before, welcome back. Lovely to have you here as always. The Careers by Jen podcast is recorded on the unceded and traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Katsi, the Kwantlen, the Stolo, and the Coquitlam First Nations. Now, before I jump into the seven tips, I want to say that I have been speaking for a living for more than 30 years. I taught in healthcare for 23 years or so, and I spent hours and hours in classrooms in front of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students giving lectures and teaching classes. I am an ordained clergy member and I speak and preach in front of people regularly. And this past year and a half, that's all been online. And I have spoken on stages at conferences in several places around North America. And I offer workshops and keynotes and of course this podcast and now my YouTube channel. So I can say I have some experience and some skill in public speaking and in presenting. And guess what? (laughs) I still get nervous sometimes, and I definitely still make mistakes. So even with three decades, more than three decades of experience with presenting, and before that, I was in uh, community theater and uh, did a little bit on film. So anyway, with, with all of that experience, there are areas I can improve upon, and there are things that I can still learn. So all that to say, there is always room for improvement, and there are definitely some things that you can do that will level up your presentation, no matter what your skill level is or what your experience is. Sound good? All right, let's begin. The first thing to do is to have a plan. And You need to outline what you're going to talk about. You don't want to have too much information. Uh, You don't want to be memorizing it word for word, because then if you get lost or distracted and lose your place, uh, you can be standing there with uh, like a deer in the headlights and be completely stuck. So you don't want to do that. It would be better to really know your material well, know what you want to cover and have at least an outline Um, somewhere, if you have it on your phone, or you have it on paper, if you want to be old school about it, or you just know when you look at the slide that you have, that that's what you want to talk about. You need a plan, you need an outline, you need a plan, and you need to practice. These are really, really important pieces. And this is just tip number one, I know that's a lot of things in one, but have a plan. Because Yes, there are very a very few people in this world who can wing it and have it come out okay, but for the most of the rest of us, you need to do some planning and some preparation. And you know what? The planning and the preparation shows, and you might be able to make it sound 
spontaneous and sound like you just got up and started telling stories and talking and sharing your wisdom. But believe me when I say the people that can do that really, really well have practiced and practiced and practiced doing it. So have a plan and uh, and make sure you prep and prepare. Second thing is to use a power stance to help combat con- uh, your lack of confidence if you're nervous, and then remember to breathe. <laughs> so before you begin, one thing that you can do, and uh, Dr. Amy Cuddy was the first one who talked about this in a TED Talk that she did, one of the things you can do is you can trick your body and your brain into confidence. I do have a video that talks about how to be more confident if you want to know more about that on on the YouTube channel. But your brain responds to whatever your body is doing. And, And sometimes it does that instinctively. And so what you can do is you can get yourself into a power stance when you're waiting outside or you're waiting in the hallway, you're waiting off stage, wherever you're waiting to go in to do this presentation. And what I mean by a power stance is pretend you are Wonder Woman or Superman <laughs> and put your feet flat on the floor about hip hips width apart. Put your hands on your hips or put your hands up in the air and pretend you've got a cape flying on behind you and a big letter on your chest and just put yourself into that position of power and strength even for two minutes and your body will click in to, your brain will click into thinking that you are feeling more confident. Um, if, if you are nervous and you are all hunched over, your, your brain is going to stay that way and uh, continue to be nervous. So you need to trick your, your brain and your body, therefore, into feeling confident even when you're not. And you can do it by making your body move into that power stance and your brain will follow. It's uh, There's research behind this. It's very interesting. And the other thing to do is to remember to breathe because you don't want to be passing out. <laughs> and believe me, I have been exceedingly nervous in some situations. I've done a lot of corporate training um, where I go into different organizations and teach a one-hour class or whatever it happens to be. And uh, before COVID, a couple of years ago, there was um, a situation where I was to go speak, do a corporate training. And it was on a topic that I was familiar with that I'd done trainings on before for this company that I contracted with. But what I hadn't looked at closely when I got the booking form was the number of participants. And usually I'm in a space where there's you know, anywhere from eight people to maybe 50 people. Um, so not that many people, but but in a in a work, in, you know, in a workspace, in a conference room, in a meeting room, sometimes it will be at a retreat like thing. So there'll be more people sitting around tables in a retreat center or, or whatever. Um, and I hadn't really looked at this. And so I was getting myself to sit down and start prepping for this thing. When I took a look at the numbers and the numbers said uh, 350 or more. And I went, oh, where is this particular training? And I looked and it was in the uh, Hotel Vancouver, which is a big Fairmont hotel, CP hotel, in one of the ballrooms. And I thought, oh, crap. (laughs) Well, uh, this requires a different kind of um, preparation and um, and power stance than does walking into a small boardroom with 10 people to do a casual conversational style presentation. And when I got there, I had to go over to a sound booth and I had to be kitted up with the, um, the wireless mic and I was told my cue and I had to walk onto a fully fancy stage with lights to theme music. (laughs) It was kind of fun, really. Um, But uh, talk about a bit terrifying. And there was a plexiglass podium 
that I was to stand behind and the plexiglass, they gave me a clicker for the slide that was massive on a screen behind me and then on different screens around the room. And um, it was for a bank and it was for all the managers of all the branches anywhere around. And I guess they'd come in for a conference. And I hadn't realized that when I had first um, looked at the booking form Uh, Because again, the topic was super familiar. It was something I was going to talk about. I talked about many, many times. And uh, it was when I sat down to start preparing. And then when I had to make the phone call to the organizer, and I got all the details. Um, it was it was when I first sat down to start all that prep that I realized <laughs> it was a different kind of presentation. So preparation was really important because, yeah, I got nervous when that theme music started and I had to run up the stairs. It's like, please don't trip <laughs> in front of 350 or 400 people. And, uh, and it was a different style of presentation when you're in front of that big of an, an audience. So uh, you need to prepare on many, many levels and um, and use the power stance to help in the back. And I definitely did that at the back of the room. <laughs> hopefully no one was looking um, while someone else was speaking before it was my turn to run up there. So um, that was number two. Number three is use thoughtful and minimal visual aids. So if you're going to use slides, the power that happens when you have good slides on in a presentation when you're speaking the power is that there's not a lot of words on the slides that that makes it more powerful imagery is far more evoking of emotion which is what you want in a presentation now if you're doing a presentation on the financial update of your organization it <laughs> there might be different emotions but <laughs> but you're giving knowledge you're imparting knowledge if you're teaching in a classroom often you're doing it by listing things that you want people to write down or remember and facts but even still bullet points keep them to a minimum the words associated with the bullet points keep them to an absolute minimum because it's awfully hard we've all been in presentations where you can't read the tiny tiny font that's on the screen it's useless it's a waste of time to to try and read that and um and then to have the presenter just stand up there and read that that's not engaging that's not interesting so it would be far more interesting to um put up an image of something and then discuss what is happening and what you want people to think about and talk about that is um represented by the image that you see on the screen so you can do so much with slides in a presentation and yeah once in a while put some words up there that's fine but choose your visual aids thoughtfully and make them minimal as far as um as how challenging it will be to see one of the things that's helpful to remember is that there are three different kinds of learners um there are the audio learners auditory learners who learn things by hearing so that would be your speaking right then there's the visual learners and so for the visual learners and apparently we are all visual learners as well the imagery will be important uh, providing you you can see, of course, uh, for those who can't, then the audit, audio is important. And it's important to hit all three if you possibly can. The third kind of learning is kinesthetic or physical learning. So when you do something, you learn. I I play with buttons and, and poke around with things and figure out how to use a piece of equipment. And, and I like to watch somebody else do it, and then I do it. And I learn that way far faster than if I have to sit down and read a manual. Um, so if you're using as many of those things as you can in a presentation, it will be far more effective than if it's just one modality. So audio, auditory, so audio, you can use sound, you can use music, you can use sound effects, um, visual, so imagery or props, if you have props. And, uh, and then kinesthetic means you're getting them to do something. So even if that's answering a question, thinking about something, filling out a worksheet, um, doing an activity, all of those things can help. So that was number three. Number four is to choose your body language consciously. Now you can't control 
how nervous you feel, (laughs) because even if you do all of the things, sometimes you're still nervous. You can't control what other people in the room are doing necessarily, or the temperature, or when technology fails, or whatever. But you can control your own uh, physical self and what your body is doing with itself while you're doing the presentation. So if you know your hands are going to shake, then hold the podium if there is one. Um, If there isn't one, maybe you can pull a chair in front of you and and hang on to the back of the chair. If you know your hands are going to shake, there are things that you can do. Um, If you feel comfortable standing behind something and you know the space, sometimes it's really important to go to the space first if you're able to, or even a few minutes before and see what the lay of the land so that you know what you're walking into. If you're able to sit, if it's a tiny group of people, often I will sit so that we're all sitting on the same level. And that's a body language choice because I want my teaching style is collaborative and I want to be talking with people in a circle if I possibly can um, because then we're all collaborating together rather than me standing at the front lecturing to people. And in some cases, that's what I'm doing. If it's a keynote speech, I'm usually up on a stage or I'm in front of a bunch of people and um, and they're expecting me to be doing that. So it depends on the setting and the situation, but you can choose your body language consciously. Where will you stand? Um, what or who will you look at? And um, and, and, you know, how often are you going to pause and look around? All of these things are things that you can control. And I do beseech you <laughs> to think about these things before you get to your presentation. So think about what you're going to do with your body. You know your body best if you have a sore knee and can't stand the whole time. Maybe there's a stool you can kneel on or sit on. Um, these are some of the things that you can set up in advance so that you are the most comfortable you can be so that you can do the best that you can in your presentation. So that is number four. Number five is to smile and connect with your audience. And that sounds um, like, duh, of course, you're supposed to do that. But when you're nervous, it's hard to remember sometimes to smile. And when you're concentrating hard, I remember um, one of my kids um, played violin when she was really little. And she was concentrating really hard on what her fingers were doing on the one side and what her other hand and her bow were doing on the other side. And she had this face that made her look like she was mad or or just really unhappy while she was playing. And I knew that that wasn't the case, that she was just concentrating. But I remember sitting there in in the audience or in the practice room or whatever and putting my fingers on the side of my mouth indicating, you know, smile, smile. And when she'd catch my eye, she'd remember and she this big smile would come across her very cute face. But um, but it was just because she was concentrating so hard and thinking about what she was doing and performing, right? And so smiling is sometimes something you forget to do, but it really helps you to connect with people and connect with your audience that you're talking to. So um, remember to smile. And there's this thing that where people say, if you're nervous, don't look at the faces, look above the heads. I think that's bunk. Like people want you to look them in the eye and um, you don't have to be creepy about it. You don't have to, you know, but when you notice somebody who's responding and nodding and smiling back to you, that's, those are the people that you want to play to. Those are the people that you want to deliver this content to. If they're playing on their phone or they're fiddling with their shoe or whatever, maybe they're not that interested, but the ones who are, are giving you their time and their attention. And that is a precious, precious gift. So those are the people that you want to be looking to, smiling at, talking to when you're doing the presentation and try to make sure you spread that around. If there's five or six people or 15 or 20 people, make sure you're moving around the room and looking at the people. And uh, and one of the things you can do after you're used to presenting is you can gauge how things are landing often and you can tell when people are flagging when the energy is good when people are responding when they don't understand you it's reading the room and you'll get to be able to do that after a while um, after you've had some experience doing it 
So look at, and if you're not doing this live, if this is really important, I've been talking as though all of this is live. If you are doing a presentation on screen, like many, many of us are doing right now, a lot of the same things um, are relevant. Um, the, the body language, as far as where you stand and where you sit, you know, are you sitting up straight? Are you centered in the screen? Um, are you not rustling your papers or your microphone? All that kind of stuff. Those are important. But the very, very important thing to do to remember when you're on screen is to look at the actual lens of the camera. Because often we will look at the faces that we see on the, the monitor. Um, but what the people see is you looking down and not looking directly at them. So it's it takes practice. It takes work to remember to look up at that little light at the top. That's the actual camera. If you're doing it on a laptop or a computer or you have a webcam, look at the lens of the webcam so that you are looking directly in the faces so that when people are looking at you, they get the sense that you are looking right back at them, even though you're not. It's a bit of a dis disconnect. It's really weird. <laughs> but again, it takes practice. So you can practice all of this in advance. Smile and connect with your audience, whether you're in person or not, so that people get the sense that you're talking to them. Okay, number six is learn from others. And... Um, a teacher that I've been listening to uh, quite a bit when learning video stuff says all the time that success leaves clues. And what he means by that is watch successful people. So I would say watch TED Talks, watch people giving speeches or presentations that are, are really good on YouTube. Go find somebody talking um, in a similar, you know, situation that you will be in if it, and, and watch, there's so much video out there. You should be able to find something, watch what they're doing that works and don't copy it because you are you and you are not them, but emulate it, right? Imitate it, figure out what it is that they're doing. That's working that you like, what are you connecting with? that they are doing that you can integrate into your presentation. So that is one of the best ways to learn how to do a lot of this stuff is to find somebody that you admire and respect who's doing it well and, and do what they're doing <laughs> in your own way, of course, but integrate that into what it is you are doing. So learn from others and, uh, and do some research especially if you've got enough lead time before you have to do this presentation. The seventh thing, the last thing to remember is that people want you to succeed. For the most part, people want you to do well and are rooting for you and will respond and will clap and will uh, give you feedback, etc. People want to be there and want to learn from you. Now, it's a different situation if you're going in to do something that nobody wants to hear. Now that is a different situation. And there are, are some different skills. I've been there, done that, uh, had to teach uh, a whole program to a bunch of people who didn't want to learn it. And the reason I had to teach it is because they had been told by their employer, if you don't learn this, you're fired. And then they brought in um, our organization to do the teaching. And man, that was hard slogging because you're walking into a room with a bunch of people who are mad and who are sitting there with their arms crossed and who have been, quite frankly, put in a terrible situation. And, and so it's really, really hard to learn when you're mad. And so part of that was that I had them for six months. So I got to see them three times a week for six months. But what I did get to do with them, what I did at the beginning was I just let them talk and I listened really well and I let them uh, get to a place where they they understood that I understood and that we finally agreed, let's just make the best of this and let's get you through this and let's do it together. And it worked, but not for everyone. There were a couple of people who left, but um, for the most part, the rest of them stayed and it ended up being a good experience, but it would not have been a good experience if I walked in and started trying to give them all the content immediately because they weren't receptive, they weren't ready. Um, I've done workshops where I've had to go in and talk about... Um, 
uh, respectful uh, workplace, uh, bully, anti-bullying, um, political correctness, Me Too stuff, all of that. And those are often uncomfortable situations because the uh, company has uh, hired the speaker to come in and do that work because there's been an issue and people are not, in, you know, not always willing to be told they have to go sit in a workshop. So it depends on the context um, as to how it's received. But but in general, and for the most part, if people have to be there, even if they have to be there, they want you to be good and they want you to succeed. So um, there's goodwill. And that's I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There's goodwill and people are rooting for you. And, uh, and, you know, honestly, uh, people in person, especially, are usually polite. If it's on the screen, they might just shut off their camera and be doing something else. And so as long as they're not heckling you, it's all good. <laughs> uh, so those are the seven things to help you level up your next presentation. And if you have any questions about this, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer them and to talk to you about them. Next week, I have a special treat for you. Sometimes he gets called scary voice dude. <laughs> Sometimes he's just the deep voiced intro guy. I call him Scott and my husband, and he is a life and corporate coach. And Scott will be joining me for episode 299, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about stories and how the stories we tell ourselves can lead to either our own sabotage in our careers and in our life, or they can lead to our own successes in our careers or in our lives. So stay safe. I'm excited to bring you Scott next week. And until then, you take good care. You've been listening to Careers by Jen with Jen Swanson. If you like what you heard, please share this. You know, if every single person listening today shared this episode with just one friend, our audience would be twice as big just like that. And the more people we can help with our content, the better. So help out a friend and help grow our audience by sharing this show with someone you know who would benefit from the content. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And together we can make a difference. Until next time, take good care.